Um, this talk's going to discuss some pretty frank topics. If you wandered in here not knowing what's coming, um, you might want to consider leaving in the next few slides. Uh, so I work on uh, internet-based crimes against children. I have since about 2008. Um, I've been in the field of networking and network security since, well, I graduated uh, with a PhD in 1999, and ever since then I've been at UMass. And so this talk's going to try to um, have a conversation that's not been had. Uh, so let's do that. So here's an outline of my talk. Uh, I'm going to give you a pretty frank and deep background on internet-based uh, child sexual exploitation. Um, I'm going to talk about the tension. I mean, I can't do this, especially at this venue, without talking about the, as, as Alyssa said, the privacy owed to victims and free speech, right? As I'm going to talk in depth about this is a huge dilemma, I don't have a solution. Um, I don't think, I don't think um, we can address this um, without a frank discussion about the limitations here and put everything on the table. So I'm also going to tell you ahead of time that uh, this is an invited talk, and so I get to have an opinion. So my opinion is that Tor and services are not, on balance, a win, okay? And so let's put out some caveats here. Uh, the first is, let's be careful to distinguish Tor Onion services from the Tor browser. So I'm going to try and be really careful about that in my talk, and I hope if you have questions for me at the end, you might, you might do the same. Okay, some, some other uh, caveats are all opinions here are solely my own, not anybody else's. I work with a great uh, team of very talented people, but um, I'm kind of leaving their names out on purpose so that um, if you disagree, you can disagree with just me. I'm going to show you as many statistics as I can in this talk. For any slide that I have up, I'll put a URL in the corner, and that um, there's no paper to go along with this talk. I thought that might help provide some source material, but there's no statistics here that are official releases. I'm not, I'm not a member of any agency. I'm not law enforcement or anything like that, um, and I wouldn't reference them in any sort of meaningful manner, but I think they're going to inform our discussion. So just to repeat, um, you know, the big trigger warning, right? I mean, this is going to be the most candid talk you've ever seen on this topic because it's never done, ever. And I think people, especially in this community, don't really know what's out there. It's just kind of a topic. It's a topic that's very painful and really nobody wants to talk about in general, like outside of this room, outside of this community. Um, it's some horrible stuff. OK. So let's begin here. Um, is child sexual abuse material actually illegal? Not universally, it turns out. Um, there's a great group called the International Center for Missing and Exploited Children for uh, well over a decade, since 2006, I guess. Uh, they've been um, doing great surveys of the legislation that exists among the, let's say, what I think it's 196 countries around the world. Their first edition was in 2006. Um, and at that point, they, looking around, discovered that uh, only five countries had what they call strong legislation, whereas 27 of them at the time had what they're labeling sufficient. They were sort of missing an important um, law. And actually, 95 countries had no legislation at all, which is just really wonderful. 136 of them didn't criminalize possession, but did criminalize distribution. Okay, so there's some, there's some subtleties here, and if you're um, into security because of policy, this is a great area to look into. Things have really changed. Um, I sort of made this bar chart myself, or, or I should say line chart, uh, just looking through the additions of their report. Um, things have changed quite a bit. I mean, it's not that great. According to their metrics, 21 countries, only 21, I mean, that's better than five, have strong legislation at this point. 38 still do not criminalize possession. 16 still have no legislation at all. Um, but at least 118 have met this sort of minimal viability that they've put together. Okay, but certainly in the US, it's definitely legal, illegal. Um, and let's talk about what happens here. So um, I also want to be clear, I'm not talking about sexting between teens. I'm not talking about first year college students going back and dating their high school uh, boyfriend or girlfriend. Police, uh, law enforcement, investigators of this crime are concerned about the youngest of children and uh, images and videos that are created from um, their rape and abuse. And I mean the youngest, I'm talking infants and toddlers. Okay, so if you're uh, a perpetrator of this crime, you will create this material, and that's where the problem begins, right? Possession is, you know, really the start of this, and the internet has made this more distributable than ever before. It's a, I mean, we all know this, right? It's a global network, um, and things start to exacerbate from there. There's plenty of public forums to share this in. Um, what's happened more recently, and I'll get into depth about this, is that 
uh, perpetrators have organized themselves into pro-offending subcultures. They found themselves online and they're training each other in how to do this. They're training each other in how to avoid detection, training each other on how to, um, how to perpetrate this crime. And then they're normalizing the, the behavior among themselves, right? Like if you feel like you are something that nobody else is, and then you find somebody who believes that, you've normalized the behavior and you feel good about it, okay? So, so technology, distributed systems that enable a pro-offending subculture to, bound, to bind together are a force multiplier for this problem. Okay, so now that that's there, those things together cause another problem, and that's persistence. Images that are placed online stay there, right? Like people who do this, there's various reasons that they do this. There's deep psychology here that I'm certainly not an expert in. Some people are obsessed with collection, collecting these uh, images in a way that um, mimics almost hoarding in a way. I don't, I don't I'm not a sociologist, I don't even want to label it in any way. But in any case, that coupled with the very resilient, I mean, we're really good at what we do, right? We've built very resilient storage systems, distributed systems, and these images tend to stay online. Okay, and so that's going to be a problem. So also the offending, as I mentioned, or as I alluded to, the, the organized subculture of offenders have taught each other how to groom children. So what does that mean? I mean, you need to normalize this behavior not just, not just to yourself as an offender, but you need to make it normal to a child. You need to show them images that makes it seem like, hey, people do this all the time, don't worry about it, it's very normal, okay? So what happens once you've been groomed? I mean, not only are you abused, and then you're gonna be back in, I don't wanna call it a cycle, but you're back to creation, uh, creating your, your, you know, these crimes against you are, are some of what gets created here. You're in for, a, essentially studies have shown a life of pain, right? I mean, ongoing psychosis, very difficult to recover from. Uh, and then you might end up being trafficked as a child or as an adult, and then the cycle continues. So this is kind of the ecosystem here. It's not just about, hey, you've got this picture, how horrible. You have to put yourself in the perspective of the victim here. Okay, so to really drive this home, because this is not going to be an easy talk to sit through, I want to read this statement which was uh, submitted to a court case. So this is a public document. I didn't actually provide the URL for this because I, I still feel a little bit iffy about it. The URL at the bottom is to a really, really excellent article by Emily Bazelon, who's this fantastic writer um, uh, in part for the New York Times Magazine. There's a URL there. Um, but anyway, uh, so this says, uh, my uncle started to abuse me when I was only four years old. At first he showed me pornographic movies and then he started doing things to me, right? What is this? This is grooming. Where are those images from? Online. There's a lot I don't remember, but now I can't forget because the disgusting images of what he did to me are still out there on the internet. That's persistence. This is from an adult, right? This is surviving the abuse into adulthood. Every day, that I live in, uh, that every day of my life, I live in constant fear that someone will see my pictures and recognize me and that I will be humiliated all over. I mean, I think we all share a notion being at this conference in this particular field. It's uncomfortable to socialize with people, right? Like sometimes at this conference or wherever you are, you're not really sure who's in the room and whether you want to talk to them. Imagine like every day of your life, every time you enter a room, wondering whether these strangers have seen these pictures of this horrible crime. Um, I often, I kind of sometimes wonder about, like we care so much about medical records and the fact that they don't get out. What if the video of your session with the doctor was online? What if a video of like you being abused was online? I mean, this is such an amazingly hard problem. Um, this is, you know, a show of pain. And, you know, I do not choose to be there, but now I am there forever. I want it all to be erased. I mean, this is someone who needs our help. And this is a privacy sensitive community. This is a privacy issue. Right? Child abuse, child sexual abuse, and the inseparable notion of what the internet has provided to that is a privacy issue that we should all care about, okay? So what can we do about that? So another sort of little secret that doesn't, I don't know if it's a secret, but another thing that really doesn't get written up at all is that anytime you put up a, a social network of any kind, big or small, anyone, you are allowed, and you give out free services because you want to drive up the number of users, people are going to use that for various things. I mean, we all know that uh, criminals are early adopters for everything. So every tech company out there has a group of people, quite honestly, I don't think they publicize this because they don't want their products to be associated, but that group of people looks through, pretty much required by law, for child sexual exploitation images and takes them down and then reports the people that are out there. So Facebook has an amazing group on this. Microsoft has an amazing group. Microsoft has done fantastic work, especially with Hani Farid, who's really um, has done just amazing work to help this issue. Um, and then they filter. 
right? So I don't recommend you do this at home, but this is what happens if you Google child pornography uh, on Google, uh, and you will not find child pornography. They will filter the results out, and then I love this. Somebody took out this ad. I wonder if this is someone actually paid for this or Google just puts it up there. Child abuse imagery is illegal if you see it, report it, right? So a little bit of a warning there. So filtering helps, right? Helps uh, prevent a community from being formed. Who else filters? Well, it turns out that the piratebay.org filters, right? This first bastion of free speech that we're going to get into. If you search for the term child porn on the Pirate Bay, you'll end up with this infamous case, which let's not get into that, but you won't get torrents that involve child pornography. Where else could we go? We could go to Reddit, right? So this is, uh, again, URL at the bottom here. These are comments from the um, general manager of Reddit a number of years ago talking about some of the difficulties they have in, in organizing uh, a site that has such loose free speech uh, policies. And what that person talked about um, was, well, you know, sometimes we have more morally questionable Reddits like Jailbait. Jailbait is the name of the Reddit there. Um, and that's part of the price of free speech, right? That's often an argument we as technologists will say. We'll say, I'm doing this great thing, it's really important, I'm giving people good performance, good security, but you know, there's gonna be a cost. That's just part of the game, right? We'll solve it down the road, or don't, don't hamper my technology, it will work out in the end, don't want early regulation, things like that. Well, it turns out that for various reasons, at some point, Reddit changed their mind, right? Some of this had to do with, there was, maybe you weren't following this, but there was a lot of talk at some point about, um, what is it called, revenge pornography, right? Putting up uh, images of someone you've dated um, and then you know, to, to take revenge on them. And so they changed the policy, I think, in part to that, but I honestly don't know when they changed it. But this is the new policy. And of course, uh, well, not of course, but now suddenly they specifically list no involuntary uh, pornography, but also you can't have sexual or even suggestive content involving minors. So maybe not this, but various people at various times have been upset with Reddit's filtering of the content that's on there and they formed various communities. Maybe not even Reddit, but people have formed other communities out there. One of them is Gab, if you're familiar with that. Turns out that Gab actually filters obscenity and pornography, part of their terms of use. Who else? Why don't we go over to Vote? Vote is pretty permissive. What? Turns out no illegal content there. How about, what, everyone know the next one I'm gonna go to? 4chan. 4chan is like a free for all for free speech, but what's the policy? Uh, if you don't know those terms, that's little, and I mean little, boys and little girls. Uh, so no child pornography. And then they even raise the bar from there. I mean, I love that they even use these terms. Like, they just expect that their users are apparently, you know, understand that. But anyway, no, absolutely no underage content, under 18 of any sort. And then where's the last place you can go? It's not quite the last place. We'll get to that. Achan, right? Do we all know Achan? It's been in the news lately. What do we know about Achan? Free speech community. Very serious about it. Why were they in the news? Because someone took a gun in New Zealand and shot 51 people in a mosque. What did that person do first? They posted their whatever, whatever they had to say, they posted it to HN. Okay. A little while later, somebody went to a synagogue, I believe this was in San Diego, if I have this correct, um, posted it to HN before they did that. Very recently, a couple weeks ago, maybe not even, a lot of people were killed in El Paso. What did the person do? Post it to HN ahead of time. Okay, so HN is really in the news lately, um, kind of having a lot of problems. And what could be done, right? Because ISPs are not responsible for the content of the forums that they are supporting, right? Definitely ISP is gonna stay away here because they don't wanna get into editorializing what takes place on their forums. But what happened? Finally, an ISP had enough, right? So this ISP, Cloudflare, said after, from what I can read, I don't know anyone at Cloudflare, and I certainly don't know this gentleman who's the CEO, but seemed to have really deliberated this internally, as far as I can tell, and then at some point decided to stop supporting HN. Why? And I want you to pay attention to why here, because this will come up later in the talk. Because HN ignored warnings. And by the way, I'm here today for, well, I'm here to tell you as a friend, right? This is, like, everything I'm saying today is, like, what everyone outside of this community, and I'm not pointing to anyone in particular, I'm just, like, it's as if nobody, everyone else in the world knows this, but other people don't, okay? So anyway, ignored warnings and tolerated hate. And what's tolerance, by the way? Tolerance is not advocating hate, right? It's tolerating it, it's saying, well, if you're gonna hate that, I'm, if you're gonna be involved in hate, I'm not gonna stop you, okay? And so that's why they pulled their support. They said that they, that HN seemed to be willing to ignore laws against violence incitement in order to avoid moderating its platform. 
Uh, that realization, along with multiple mass murders, tipped the scale at uh, Cloudflare. And then I love this quote. If we see a bad thing in the world and we can't help get and we can help get in front of it, we have some obligation to do that. And so they pulled their support. And so this is like a huge deal. This starts the dilemma that we're gonna go down, right? I mean, this is where it's gonna start to get hard because this is a free speech issue. And so there's lots of articles I put up here, could have put up here about uh, free speech problems, but I'm gonna get to this later in the talk. I did wanna bring up this other one, I love this. The 8chan people were like, what can we do now? We need a new ISP, and by the way, they found one. Uh, but in the meantime, they started using uh, a peer-to-peer -peer network to host themselves. And then what happened? The HN users were very disturbed because they noticed that the site they were using actually had some boards that clearly hosted child pornography. The HN people freaked out, and then they got off that site. Okay? And it turns out that if you look into it, what are the rules of HN? There's only a couple rules. One of them is no obscenity. In fact, they're quite proud of this. They've deleted and banned uh, rooms that slash CP, right? That stands for child pornography. Slash pedo, pedophilia. Global, I love this. Globally, HN has had an average turnaround time of only one hour for deleting obscene images from, from minors. This is 40, meaning 48 hours normally for NICMIC, which is the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Fantastic organization, by the way. Um, and then they even warn you, if you're thinking of posting illegal content to HN, please think again. We will not protect you, OK? So <laughs> HN has its limits, too. All right. So where do we go from here? How do you solve this problem? How do you address it, right? We're gonna get into the other issues that come up, but you may be wondering, like, what do you do about this? Well, this is a law enforcement issue, right? Like, you have to, if you wanna protect children, like, what do you do? So very coarsely, and this is a very, uh, I'm really making things very uh, simplified here, but there's kinda just two strategies, let's just say, two classes of strategies you can go with. You can have a passive strategy as a law enforcement investigator, and that's where you wait for tips to come in. You rely on the community to report things to you, if you know of a particular child who's being abused, you can go, for example, in the US to cybertip.org. That's a, a government, or, I think maybe it's NICMIC, but it's a, um, put up by the, uh, anyway, it's a place you should go. Um, there's cyber tips in other countries as well, if you're from another country. Um, and this can be because you've discovered your neighbor, maybe you're a teacher and you recognize something about a child, maybe it's someone in your family. Um, and this has been wildly successful. This is the latest data I could find put out by the government. You can see the number of tips that they've received from uh, this website and other ways. Um, local and state and federal uh, agencies in the U.S. work really hard uh, to, on these cases. They're completely understaffed. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, underfunded. Uh, you can see this tremendous rise in 2015, which was many years ago. 90,000 cyber tips came in, specifically for child sexual abuse. Okay? So, What's the problem with this? It doesn't work for children who have yet to be discovered. It doesn't work for children who have been silenced by fear. That's definitely part of the grooming process. Don't talk about this, right? That's the, definitely one of the first things you'll hear. And it doesn't work for kids who don't yet talk or are unable to speak, okay? So what else can you do as law enforcement? How do you solve that? Well, what you do is you take on proactive investigations, okay? So in, I'm really going to simplify a lot of stuff here. This is, you know, how you actually do this is a really, um, you really have to be careful about this. There's a lot of policies. There's a lot of US law involved here. This is forensics. This is digital forensics. There's a science to it. You've got to do it right. I don't have time to get into that into this talk. But let's just say broadly, you get in a public forum. I mean, this is how you bust people in drugs if you wanted to. Go down to the park late at night wait for people to offer you drugs, right? Get on a public forum and say, does anyone here have child, well, child sexual abuse material, you wouldn't say it that way. Uh, and then someone says, I've got it. And you say, well, can I have it? And they say, sure, why don't you download it for me? And then they'll say, by the way, here's a cryptographic identifier that ensures that you've got the right thing. I mean, there's no way to mess up here. But in any case, you download it, you can visually inspect it as a law enforcement officer. Um, and this will, again, aligning a lot of process here, will be um, what goes into, among other things, a search warrant. You'll visit their house. And ideally, you'll actually rescue a child, right? I mean. Uh, you know, there's a funny thing here. If you don't find a child, there's a viewpoint that, like, you got there before the child was abused, before the person escalated beyond just looking at pictures to actually abusing a child. But the other viewpoint is, well, at least you rescued a child, okay? So why would you do this? Um, as I'm sort of uh, intimating here, possession is correlated with contact offenses. There's studies that back this up. I've done a study um, that looked at, at the time of arrest, what percentage of those arrests involved people who were contact offenders, which means they were sexually abusing children. They had physical contact with the child and not just images. 
Um, and it's something, let's say, 15%. I'll come back to this for one slide later. Now, Michael Bork um, and his collaborators have done much better work than I have, really fantastic work. Um, they looked at offenders many years after arrest, which is fascinating because many years after arrest, there's time for people to come forward who might have been hesitant at first, right? The child will finally come forward, right? Other things will be unearthed. The, the person will come to terms with counseling in prison about um, what they may have done in some cases. So Bork's studies um, uh, have found that, uh, you know, these are the rate, so I said, you know, at the time of arrest, 15%. His studies find that, depending on the study, it's north of 50%. At times, I believe it's 87% uh, of the people he investigated. These are among people who have been arrested. Okay, So this is great, because this strategy allows you to rescue those infants and toddlers, those who are silenced, those who can't speak. Um, and you, and you know, I'm sorry for this one, but this is, this is, uh, this is going to, OK. So in San Diego in 2006, before I got involved in any of this, so I'm not responsible for any of this. Um, but some, um, some great investigators are. Uh, Wayne Blaley, I think his name is, was an employee of the San Diego Children's Hospital for Health, uh, or Hospital and Health Center, where he worked in the convalescent facility for 10 years. Uh, those patients, and we're talking children here, generally can't feed, bathe, or dress themselves. And so he was caught molesting children in this ward. And you know, in New York, he was looking out the window, and the, invest the investigator said, you know, how many children did you molest? And he was looking out at the snow, and he said, how many snowflakes are there out there? Later, he admitted to abusing about two kids a week. He specifically chose children who were the most brain damaged, most comatose, most nonverbal, children who could never say anything about it. How was this guy caught? He was caught because someone did a proactive investigation on a public forum and found his IP address and found th their way to his home. Like, this was never going to be found, right? This guy's, I think it's 45 years in prison. OK, I got involved in 2008. I, um, I can't fit everything into this talk, so I'm really going to kind of leave out my stuff. But we've worked really hard in my lab. I work with just the best people. Um, and we've created forensically reliable tools to give. Uh, we don't sell anything. Um, uh, but we give it to law enforcement. We help provide the training. I work with another organization that provides the training. They're among the best people I've ever met. And we train people appropriately. We work with prosecutors, and we catch people. They catch people. I provide the tools. My, my group provides the tools. So this outstanding gentleman was found in Wyoming. Uh, he was sentenced for possession of, at the time, the largest collection of child pornography, 47 terabytes. 19.5-year uh, sentence, 17 million files, prior conviction and sexual assault on a child. He was topped more recently by this gentleman. and. Um, he, this has not got, gone to trial yet, but in any case, when he was arrested, he had 58 terabytes related to child pornography. That's a lot of, that's a lot of images, okay? which also gives you a sense of the scale of what's going on here. It's not like one or two kids or something. Um, this guy uh, is from Jersey County, Illinois. He's only been charged, hasn't gone to trial yet. Uh, he was recording himself in sex acts with a seven-year-old boy. Okay, Spent decades, more than a decade anyway, doing this in online forums. OK, so you might be thinking, well, Brian's just giving anecdotal examples. One of the things that our research has done, um, this is all, a lot of this is very public. So we got out there and we measured this. Um, I mean, that's what computer science are good at. Uh, so we did it. And so in the US, I can tell you for a subset of the venues that are out there, this doesn't include any darknet traffic. It's something like, uh, on the left here, it says GUIDS. Uh, and the bottom here is over time. And GUIDS is um, a GUID. And so it's not an IP address. We did some estimation here for how you convert this into unique computers. Unique computers are still not people. So I think you're a computer scientist. You can kind of understand that. So this is something north of 40,000 per month unique computers involved in known child pornography just in the US. Doesn't include forms we can't see publicly. Doesn't include unknown or as yet unknown. As yet uh, until, you know, child pornography that's unknown to law enforcement. That's a lot. Why is this going down? I wish. I'd love to say it's going down because the excellent and very difficult work that law enforcement do. I mean, this is a very hard crime to investigate. Um, I'm fortunate. I'm, I have no special ability to possess or view or be in receipt of child pornography. So I've, I've never seen any of it. But law enforcement have a difficult psychological time dealing with this. Um, and they do a fantastic job doing it. So why has it gone down? Maybe they're doing great work here and people are being pushed off these networks. But I think. Um, People are just going elsewhere, unfortunately. Because there's only, I, I didn't actually bring a stat on this, but it's something like three to 5,000 arrests per year in the US. 
Okay, so 40,000, three to 5,000, it's not, it's not really good. So here's another, this is all just publicly available data. The, each one of these points is an IP address and it's just geolocated. It's not like someone's home or anything. It's just the center of some zip code estimated by some service or something. But this is unique IP addresses in 30 minutes in public venues sharing known child pornography. Um, this is one hour. This is six hours. There's some tension here of you know one person may have their IP address reassigned. So that's why there's the time thing there. If you're not from the US, or maybe if you don't know and you are in from the US, um, this is just actually the population density of the US, right? This is where people live. I mean, a lot of people are doing this all the time. Okay, so worldwide, this is not just a massive problem, it's a massive global problem. Uh, so this is, again, us uh, updating statistics from an old paper, but um, 800,000 GUIDs worldwide sharing known child pornography in public forums. Right? This is a massive, massive problem. Okay, so what do you do? I mean, you're, <laughs> you get online, you're a cop, and there's just 800,000 people. I mean, most of them are not in your jurisdiction, but what do you do next? You need some method of triage. You need to decide who's the most dangerous person that I'd like to um, spend my time investigating to make a case for, to go in front of a judge, to have a search warrant, to have proper legal uh, process, and so on. So one of the things we did, for example, um, is we looked at uh, the least severe child pornography. I, I, I love how I don't even have terms for this. I'm not comparing adult pornography to child pornography. I, I also, by the way, uh, it's, it's not even pornography, right? It's really child sexual abuse material. But anyway, we compared arrests. We did this very carefully with this wonderful uh, sociologist named Janice Wallach, who's incredible. Uh, and what we looked at is like for arrests, if you were arrested and online, what you shared was the least severe uh, ch uh, child sex abuse material, which involves just nudity, masturbation, or adolescent sex of minors, uh, again, very young children, uh, then 15% of the time those people were either at the, at the time found to be contact offenders or in their past. But the cases of people who were sharing the most severe uh, uh, child sex abuse material, that involves uh, sexual assault of infants and toddlers or sadistic acts, it jumps to double, 30%, right? So that gives you a clue. I mean, there's some more science to be done here. Like, was it the case that those people who were found with the most severe files, were the cops sort of frustrated and were like, I'm pulling out all the stops? Like, one of the things they could do is um, work harder at, 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 at you know, interviewing the person. I mean, there's lots of stuff that could happen here that would influence the behavior of the investigator. So anyway, again, I want to point to Michael Bork doing some great work that really separates out uh, some of the issues here. Like, you know, I don't want to claim that this is done yet. But that's some of the things you could do is develop forensic techniques and methods for law enforcement in a rigorous scientific way to help them do this cause. Okay. All right, so now let's switch a little bit and talk about um, darknets, right? Darknets a little bit different than the venues I've been talking about. So there's a lot in academia, um, but the deployed ones are really Freenet, Tor, and let's say I2P. Um, let's talk about Freenet first. Here's a view on Freenet. Some of you may have never heard of Freenet. It's an academic paper that came out in the year, I think, 2000 or 2001. It still exists. It's been kicking this whole time. Um, why is it out there? Well, let's, you know, if you're not familiar with Freenet, it's very much like a hidden service or um, I guess it's now called an onion service, right? So it's not a proxy to the internet. It's just things you can get that were previously inserted into Freenet. It's, it's sort of, uh, there's a lot to say here, but it kind of supports other applications. So one of the things it supports is a news group like application. You can see the wonderful news groups on there on the left, uh, including, um, uh, where is it? Uh, Toddler CP there near the bottom. Tor child porn is a, is a category there. Uh, and this is the offender community I was talking about. This is actually a completely textual site. This person says, are there any videos to go with these pics? Especially the last one, I think these are Kelly videos, right? I mean, this is a particular series that this person's trying to collect and then they're, they're asking for help, right? This is the community talking to one another. Freenet's enabling this. Here's a particular very cropped um, bottom of a site uh, on Freenet. Uh, these are called free sites. Uh, there's an average of 60 photos per gallery and we update every week. And this is all free, by the way, totally free. The, the product is the content, right? I mean, like, this is, this is what's, there's nothing for sale, it's just completely free. Um, definitely not your average studio stuff. Enjoy the extreme beauty and talent of this 10-year-old star, right? And so then there's some, some links there and so on you can click on, okay. So what do we do? We stepped in and we uh, harvested uh, publicly posted manifests, which are really kind of, 
I don't know, some cross between a dot onion and a dot torrent file, or just a torrent file, I guess you'd say. Uh, and we gathered these from forms that were dedicated to child sexual exploitation. Law enforcement confirmed to us that the manifests, which had overlapping, I mean, you know, a torrent is sort of a collection of files. So there was overlap in the content among these manifests, uh, by, you know, to, to give the torrent as the analogy. 31,000 known images of, of child pornography, images and video. 9,000 of the 31,000 were of infants and toddlers. Freenet, because it's different than Tor, actually enables you to, um, without breaking its anonymity, know what people are requesting. Like, it doesn't try to protect that. It's just trying to protect who requested it, not what they're requesting. So we looked, and it's 35% of the Freenet traffic was for just these manifests with the known images of child pornography, never mind what we didn't know about. That's a lot. OK, so what did we do? Uh, well, law enforcement observed this trading on Freenet. We carefully deployed or developed and deployed a forensically sound method. We did this well within case law, for, uh, Fourth Amendment law. There's a lot to know here. We did it with a quantifiable error rate, which, by the way, was near, is near zero. We worked with law enforcement to train them, develop training programs. We published our approach in a peer-reviewed venue. I apologize, it's not on this slide. It was on the previous one. Um, and then um, there were some arrests made, and then I went to court and defended it. It was upheld twice. Two independent judges, two separate courts, two separate circuits, federal. Um, this was one of the cases that I was involved in. Um, this, guy, um, this guy traveled the world in order to teach Java. Uh, and he went all over the world. One of the places he went was the Philippines, where he had sex with um, a number of um, young girls, uh, a couple of them were 12 years old. He took pictures of it on his camera. I brought it back to the United States. The camera and the pictures were found in his home. Um, he is in jail for 25 years. Okay, so what's Freenet's stance on this? Well, as I said before, they're an ISP. They clearly can't do anything. How people, this is from their website, how, the question is, uh, I don't want my node to be used to harbor child pornography, offensive content, or terrorism. What can I do? Well, how people choose to use the tool is their sole responsibility as a communication medium. Freenet cannot be considered responsible for what people use it for, just like ISPs, telecoms, or postal services cannot be held responsible for their users either. OK, and so I want to say at this point, like, I get it. I totally get it, right? I live in this world, too. Facebook, everyone, Google, every major tech company, especially the large ones, are under pressure because they're doing bad things to our privacy. The New York Times has a wonderful privacy project where they talk about, for example, you know, if you're someone who can be discriminated against for a variety of reasons, maybe you're um, part of the LGBTQ community, you need certain protections. They read privacy policies. They were an example. I completely agree. It just so happens that part of the problem is we have no federal privacy law of any meaningful design, right? Like, I mean, that would really solve a lot here. Um, I think it's also ironic, by the way, that the New York Times in putting up, you know, their website, uh, I went to builtwith.com. These are the 66 separate organizations that the New York Times wants to know, wants to let know that you're on there reading, you know, the New York Times and so on. I mean, this is like a complete disaster, right? So we need this protection. There's lots of other things that go on. And, you know, this is a well-funded community, Mozilla, NSF, DARPA, Department of State, we all know Tor originated with um, um, uh, was it, the Naval Lab, right? I mean, you know, so this is a well-funded community. But, you know, at the same time, and let's start to get into the dilemma here, and I don't have a fix, um, but um, let's look at the ACM Code of Ethics. Uh, as members of the ACM, as professionals, we're obligated to undo or mitigate the negative consequences as much as possible. One way to avoid unintentional harm is to carefully consider potential impacts of all those affected and decisions made during design and implementation. IEEE similarly has similar ethics, disclosure, all sorts of things, okay? Now, let's look at what other communities have had when they've faced dilemmas like this. This is a, a slide uh, from the machine learning community who are just, you know, outraged that Staples, the company, um, they, on their website, priced things differently. Someone was charged $15.79 for a stapler but just a few miles away, it was 1429. I mean, I'm making light of this a little bit. The deeper issue here, of course, is it's a very interesting topic of machine learning, how it can actually learn unintentionally the bias that's historically happened. Um, there's a really great article about how, uh, well, let's not, let's not get into tangents, and I'm not planning to, okay? And so they're outraged by these staples, and, and, and obviously much more deeper things involving discrimination and so on. And what did the ML community do? They, 
they got together and said, you know what, it's really important that fairness, accountability, and transparency be involved in machine learning. Let's get together and solve this problem. Bitcoin is another disaster. Uh, I work in this field, uh, full disclosure. Uh, you know, we've all seen reports of Bitcoin uses more energy than Ireland, um, I think than Denmark, in fact. Um, takes more energy than mining gold. Uh, lots of opinions about how it's a huge waste of energy. Just so happens, though, it's a lot easier to solve things in Bitcoin. You can just switch to proof of stake, right? Doesn't, it's just, uh, proof of stake is, um, I, I don't know, I think this is fair to say, but let's just say it's applying known concepts from distributed computing to get rid of the whole proof of work concept and save a lot of energy. It's an easier road here, right? Like, if you're in ML or you're in Bitcoin, the trolley problem is a lot easier. You see bad things are coming, and you just gotta switch tracks, right? It takes a lot of effort, a lot of things, a lot of problems come from that but it's an easier problem to solve. It may be harder to, to make those solutions. We have a much more difficult problem than what I'm here to talk to you about today, right? Like darknets are wrestling with a lot of issues. It's, it's a zero sum game. You're gonna hurt one community or the other because there's a lot of people that need this protection. And I would submit to you that like, I don't really have a correct answer, but we can start to analyze the case here. So some of the analysis I think we should do is, I, my personal belief is that if some technologies uh, those technologies should not be pursued if the societal costs outweigh the benefits. And we can ask, in pursuit of greater privacy, are we sufficiently considering the cost to society? And are we overestimating the benefits of these technologies and not considering alternatives? In answering these questions, we can really start to answer that. This is the video that I put up at the top. I, I don't have time to play the whole thing, but I encourage you to Google Phoenix 11. This is a group of victims who have bound, uh, found themselves and made a video and are trying to advocate for themselves to get out from under this. Right? And so there's a real cost here um, that we have to consider. Now, let's, let's, let's go into question two here. What are the benefits? Well, so just in case you don't know and you're randomly at Usenix, uh, you know, what's the point of this? What's the point of Onion Services, for example? Well, so normally Bob would go to the New York Times and in doing so, he would reveal his IP address and that's how most of the world operates. But some people would rather have some privacy here, right? And so they're gonna, or at least anonymity. And the way they're gonna do that is they're gonna use the Tor browser, which again is a separate item. And by using the Tor browser, and I'm really, if you know how Tor works, uh, these little two blue gears that I made and some colored lines really don't do it justice. But the idea is that you're going through uh, very uh, well multi-proxy system out to the New York Times site and they don't know your, your IP address. Now that's very distinct from the Onion Services product and the goal of that is to not reveal the IP address of the website itself. And from within Tor, uh, you can contact the website and everyone's anonymous and that's great. Okay, so when do you need to set up a, your own server using Onion Services? The answer might be that you're a newspaper, or you're Facebook and you would like people to be able to contact you. Nope. That's not true, right? Like you can, you can put New York Times and Facebook out there on the web and have people use Tor browser to contact you. It's not necessary. There's performance reasons you might want to be an Onion site or a hidden service, but it's not necessary. And so SecureDrop is not, to me, a good example of why Onion services are helpful because you could provide it without them. Slightly different, but you could provide it. Do you need it if you want to be involved in hate speech? Nope, turns out you can anonymously contribute to the hate speech community. There's plenty of them out there. You can use Tor browser to do that, okay? So here's another obvious example. What if you're involved in things that are illegal? Perhaps you're involved in illegal drugs, or maybe you've stolen some of the credit cards of people who've paid their way to get into this conference. Maybe you've stolen their PayPal accounts, or you've hacked into their systems. Maybe you're selling malware to invade their privacy. Maybe you're involved in human trafficking, including child sexual exploitation. Well, that's a good reason to hide your IP address, okay? And so don't take my word for it. There's several studies for this. Here's a great one. Um, there's a reference there to the DOI in the bottom. Some of the things that are said in this scientific article, the most common uses for websites, uh, Tor hidden services, uh, on Tor hidden services are criminal, money laundering, um, yeah, I was gonna say surely Bitcoin based, there you go, Bitcoin based money laundering, stolen accounts, variety of drugs, illegal, uh, and so on. Websites dedicated to providing videos purporting to depict, because they weren't allowed to go, but I can tell you this is true, purporting to depict rape, bestiality, and pedophilia were abundant, including other problems. Okay, so they say legitimate sites almost always choose to identify their operations. Legitimate 
hidden service sites, while illicit hidden services almost always choose not to do so. And they have this interesting conclusion here. Even I'll say this again later. Even if you don't agree with anything I'm talking about, this is what you have to think about. To save Tor, and certainly to save Tor's reputation, it may be necessary to kill hidden services, not Tor browser, to kill hidden services at least in their present form. Okay? This is an, a, a, an Achilles heel of the Tor project, um, which I'm not a part of, so it's just my opinion. Here's a separate article which got a lot of press. You may have seen it. Um, uh, let's see, take out the automated malware traffic and 83% of the visits to Tor hidden service websites uh, are child abuse, child sexual abuse material. He says, before we did the study, it was certainly in my view that Darknet was a good thing. Okay, and so the, the Tor project responded in a couple different places saying that, well, wait a minute, this is totally, you're, you can't, don't be careful not to misquote this, you know, over 80%, but only 2% of the total traffic is part of Tor's anonymizing network, which to me is like, Really? So more than 98% or let's say 98% of the total traffic is for Tor browser, but you want to support this other thing that is unsupportable? So, but then, you know, there's other uses for this and we have to consider the balance here. Well, let's consider, well, let's come back to that. So actually, you know, what if you're this guy? Okay, so here's a real thing. I mean, that's like a scientific article, but allow me to make this more real. So maybe you heard of the Playpen site. The Playpen site had 150,000 registered and active users that logged into it to trade and form an offender community based on child sexual exploitation. Are you part of a community that has 150,000 users in it? That's a big community. That's a very large offending community that's teaching themselves how to do things. I'm not even sure there's that many people in computer science in America. Like, that's just tremendous, okay? And so this was a multiplying uh, factor. Um, this guy is, what, where is it? 30 years in prison. Outstanding individual. Um, this is what happened to Playpen. 25 US producers of child pornography were prosecuted. Uh, 51 of hands-on offenders, uh, contact offenders is what I called them earlier. 55 children were successfully identified and rescued, right? Like because of this operation, 55 children stopped having at least that part of the abuse end, right? But are in for sort of, unfortunately, a life of pain. 296 children internationally rescued due to this effort. 296 children. There aren't 296 children in this, uh, people in this room right now. 350 US arrests, 548 international arrests. Of, of course, it's not just about this crime, right? There's lots of things you can do here. There's Silk Road, there's all sorts of dark markets. Uh, that are selling malware and stolen credit cards to invade your privacy. Alpha Bay is the latest one. Um, this was taken down fairly recently. Just an enormous, I mean, 200,000 users. Um, lots of Bitcoin, other cryptocurrency stuff, fentanyl, all sorts of problems. Okay, so what do I, you know, here's one of my suggestions. If you're a reviewer for a paper or a grant, demand a justification. If you look at the, the call for papers for Popets, it tells you, the papers you're analyzing, or this is the authors, so the papers you're submitting should follow the basic principles of ethical research, maximize benefits to an individual or society while minimizing harm. I don't want, I'm definitely not here to point names, but I wanna tell you I sat down and looked through papers in not just this conference, but many conferences, the top tier places in this community, and I really find it hard to find papers that justify their work on dark nets with anything other than this helps dissidents and journalists. Like, how about a couple sentences that acknowledge that there's some harms to children and there's crime and dark nets on this type of network? Just admit it. Give a balanced view. I'm not saying the research should be done, but don't put your head in the sand. And if you're a reviewer, you need to demand that. Okay, so where are we? Sorry, I'm getting, getting upset. So, market selling, malware, you know, people invading your privacy, not to mention victims of child abuse. Um, here's the, one of the main points I want to make. All of this is outside the public view. It's outside the ability of our community to engage in filtering. Like, think about what I said about 8chan, right? Maybe you believe in whatever they're saying on that site, right? But at least someone got to say, I don't believe in it. Cloudflare got to say, we don't want to support that anymore, right? That's not happening here. So also, it, it's, you know, it's allowing this immersive subculture and, um, you know, the thing about this is, another point I want to make is, it's not even that great, right? Like, people are getting arrested for this. It's not impenetrable. It's not such a great tool. And I want to say, like, I five minutes? Okay. So I've looked through the Tor website, the Tor project website. I find these limitations to be absent fr fr from the website. It's not available to the users. 
Okay, and so you might say, wait a minute, there's a whole bunch of good uses here. So if you're gonna ask me that, I want you to distinguish very carefully what can be done with normal hosting to protect people? What can be accomplished by a VPN? And what can be accomplished with Tor Browser? And leave for me a, something that can only be done with Onion Services. Because if you're using Onion Services to do it, you're creating the trolley problem, right? You got it. The way you solve the trolley problem is to not be on that track, right? Solve it another way. Think outside the box. Do something different. And you know, who are people safe from, right? So let's agree upon, a, you know, how do you judge something as security is one of the first things I tell students in my classes. What's your definition of security? Well, something secure, this is just one definition, but something secure if it costs the attacker more money to obtain than what they're attacking is worth, or the attacker doesn't have you know, those resources. So who are they trying to protect? Journalists. Journalists are the target, and some national security organization of some government is the adversary. What resources do governments have to protect their existence? All of their resources. All of their resources. What country cannot defeat Tor? What small business cannot defeat Tor? Like, why is it that you think they won't just block the website, block Tor, or arrest you? Like, what tactics won't they take to protect their existence from something they view as an existential threat? I don't think it's sufficient. And here's like the web page. Like, go ahead. It ensures your privacy and safety. Don't worry about it. I mean, there's no notion of a limitation here. I really don't think even some people at this conference could really tell you about the limitations of Tor very well. I don't think a journalist could do it either. I don't think this is fair to the user base to do this. And you know, obvi what's obvious here is it's not that they're negligent in any way whatsoever. There's many academic papers per year that describe attacks against the Tor project. Very responsibly, they fix those flaws. I mean, why wouldn't they? They're very good people. But of course, other flaws are left in place because they have a problem that they need to balance performance, right? And until they're willing to give up performance completely, then they can't solve this problem. So what are we left with? If you're a person who wants to use Tor to go up against criminal law enforcement, I mean, it's not that good protection. It, admittedly, it takes some effort, but it's clearly not impossible. Like, there's public takedowns. And if you want to be a journalist or a dissident and go against national security, you're being given a water pistol to enter into a war with people who have bullets. Like I, I just don't think that's safe. OK, so there's, uh, you know, there's lots of ways. Um, this is from the Tor website. I, I, I want to say I have no understanding of this first quote. I've, I've been to conferences where people who work with victims and ask them directly, like, what does this mean? Because some people in survivors' communities embrace stigma instead of compassion, seeking support from fellow victims requires privacy-preserving technology. I really I have no idea what this is about. It's not true, I mean, as far as I can say. I'd love to know what it's about. I'm probably just totally mistaken. Our refusal to build backdoors and censorship into Tor is not good. Notice I've not suggested anyone put a backdoor in. Not suggesting that. OK, criminals would still have access to other methods. Yes, they would. But they would find it a lot harder to form a community, to groom each other, to rather to train each other, right? To tell each other how to avoid detection. There's no opportunity for anyone to, to, who's outside this community to, to not support it. I mean, that's the problem. It's not that they wouldn't have some other way to commit a crime. They would find it hard to commit a community without Tor. And I want to, again, if you, if you don't believe anything I'm saying, this is among my last slides here. Like, this is why Cloudflare stopped supporting HN, because that community ignored warnings and tolerated crime, tolerated violence against people, and avoided moderating the platform. Right? I mean, that's, it's an existential threat to the Tor project for less than 2% of the traffic. Right? OK, so what's my summary? Two slides left. What's, you know, remember long ago we were in another part of the talk, we were talking about crimes against children? So internet crimes against children is a massive global problem. The incidents are overwhelming. The investigators who do just incredible work, uh, you know, really giving up their own themselves into this uh, are totally underfunded. I didn't really prove that, but it's true. Offenders are based in organized communities. Victims are just as young as you can possibly imagine. Um, law enforcement are, are doing a really hard job. But you know, if you want to get into this, you can do some great, reliable, forensically sound methods to give to law enforcement to help them rescue a child. And we need to make this part of the conversation of this community. I, I don't know why I'm the only one, I'm one of the only people who talk about this. Uh, and some technology makes it hard for society to make informed decisions on behalf of the children being abused. Okay, so what do I want? This is the last slide. Here are my suggestions. And really, I'm nobody, right? But you can just take this for discussion. So first, I want to you know, make sure you understand. I want there to be research that is there to protect the most vulnerable people in our society. That's not just children to me. That's 
dissidents, journalists, people who are discriminated for any number of reasons, their ethnicity, religion, sexuality, you name it, gender, whatever it is, I, I fully believe that. That's, you know, was it Gandhi who said, you know, we, we measure our society by its ability to protect its weakest. I personally feel the Tor project must clearly quantify, in dollars perhaps, on its website, the minimal resources required by an adversary to defeat the software ahead of download. And I think that, you know, you can admit, you, how about some transparency that, or just education, let's call it, that it can't hide that you're using it. I think personally, it's time as a community to stop labeling onion services as a technology that is on balance, of course it's helpful, but on balance helpful, right, personally. If you design a system that, you know, I, I get it, right? Like, I, I go home, it's a joy to me to design new cute things and distributed systems. But if you can design a system without onion services, like, for example, SecureDrop, if you could do that without onion services, then you're obligated to do so because you're obligated to avoid the trolley problem. I want to also say that if you're encouraging people to use onion services needlessly, you're not. You're not hurting, I guess, but you're not helping. Like, the scale of people that use onion services doesn't mitigate the harm to victims. So that has nothing to do with it. Uh, if you're a reviewer, I think you need to start asking authors of darknet research if, on, you know, like, do they, are they presenting some argument about why, on balance, it's a beneficial solution, or at least to declare the harms that are involved. And personally, I feel that the sites that run onion services, because they cause right now, on a daily basis, enormous and continual harm to victims of sexual abuse, and all of you, right? Because you're the victims of other privacy crimes from these marketplaces and so on. I think, you know, it's, and it's an existential threat to the project. I mean, you're just, you're one op-ed away from losing all your funding. It's time to move on, okay? Find some other, find some other project, halt onion services, and find a different solution for supporting free speech. There's lots of other solutions out there. This is you know, a project from 2004 that I believe on balance is really not helping. Okay, so that's the end of my rant. Um, and I, I don't know how much time there is, but I'd be happy to take some questions. Okay, we'll take one question and one then question. You can also find me after, after. I'm not going anywhere. All right, I'll cede my time to Roger if he has a question, if we only have one. <laughs> yeah, so this is uh, a bunch of interesting stuff to talk about. I'd love to chat more about it. Be, Three thoughts to. in the 30 seconds that we've got. The first thought is uh, these people that you're talking about are terrible people, and I wish they would stop doing the things they're doing. So I think we, we totally have common ground on that one. Absolutely. Uh, the second thought is a lot of the ways that Tor fails to protect people are not at the level of Tor, but they're at the OPSEC level or a bunch of other. Uh, there's so many layers that you have to get right if you want to be safe right. in the world on the internet, and Tor is only one of them. So I don't want to say that Tor is perfect. It's totally not. Uh, but in each of these scenarios that you're talking about and in a lot of other scenarios for actual activists and journalists and so on, the thing that goes wrong is at a different layer than Tor. And then the third thing to talk about, uh, there are, so we made a mistake early on in letting people frame Onion services as I want to set up a website and I want to put com content on it that the man's going to hate. So. I've been thinking a lot more about this as a transport layer, a metadata secure transport layer. So you've got HTTP, you've got HTTPS, but it has the certificate authority problems and so on. And you've got Onion services as a metadata resistant transport mechanism. So for example, there are people using Onion services as instant messaging where there's no Not middle. Needed. In the iChat or XMPP or Jabber or Signal or all of those, they all have a center where they know who you are, they know where you are, they know when you're talking, they know who your friends are. And that is a really dangerous model that everybody's using. And a metadata resistant communications platform, which, which requires people to not need to know where the people they're talking to are, uh, is something that I think is really important for the world, but we're not there yet. So I, I totally uh, accept your, man, these people are talking about just, you know, stop regulating me, just let me finish my technology side. I think there's a, there's a lot of stuff to talk about here, and, uh, and I'll stop talking now and, and let somebody else go, or maybe we'll all go up to you afterwards and talk. Okay. Yes. All right, well, thanks for attending. I appreciate your, uh, you being here.